Madam President, are we ready to call roll? Trish Bodie. Here. Gloria Gonzalez Dolakia. Here. Alexis Grimes. Here. Shade Fashakun. Here. Aaron Johnson. Here. Christine Maurer. Here. Anna Smith. All right, it is 6.17 p.m. And with a quorum of the board present, I call this meeting of the Leander ISD Board of Trustees to order. We will now move into our opening ceremony. And before we stand for our pledge, I'd like to let y'all know who is going to be leading us this evening. Cadet Technical Sergeant Maddie Morin is the daughter of James and Sarah Penniman Morin. Maddie is the Air Force JROTC Public Affairs non-commissioned officer in charge. And she is a student at Cedar Park and Leander High Schools. Maddie aspires to become a nurse in the Army. Thank you so much, Cadet, for being here this evening to lead us in pledge. Thank you very much. You may be seated. All right, board. So we get to start off our meeting with our student leader. And now we go to more student leaders. It is my pleasure to move us down to the next item of our agenda, Spotlight on Learning Mason Elementary School. All right. Oops. Good evening. Welcome, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Gearing, LISD staff, and of course, our families. We welcome you to the CC Mason IB World School Spotlight. Tonight, we are here to present you with what makes CC Mason IB World School a destination campus in our community, state, nation, and world. As part of our IB accreditation, we are required to undergo a process of evaluation every five years. We successfully completed this evaluation on September 9th and are here to share the highlight from the evaluation report. While there are many celebrations within that report, our focus will be on this one summarized in the following quote, from one of the IB evaluators. See, I told you. The strength of our campus is in our people, starting with our students, staff, and community. Tonight, we have brought you our students, our most valuable resource, so that you can hear their voice and get a sense 
from them what empowered learning looks like and feels like at C.C. Mason IB World School. We are pleased to have a Assistant Principal Mary Schlung and IB Coordinator Dr. Janet Blackman here to share a glimpse of how our staff and community have been empowered to take action for student learning. Can I use this one? Okay. So when we think about strength of staff, we have a staff that extends themselves above and beyond to create an environment for our learners by empowering them really to have that voice, make choices, and really own their learning. So as a campus staff, we did apply continuous improvement methods and tools to build teacher agency as well in the evaluation process. If we want students to be empowered, it is important to also empower our staff. The tools helped us as a campus to get that collective voice, individual perspectives, and make determinations about how to develop this program. So tonight, when you hear our students express their empowerment, some teachers' names will be mentioned, but for every teacher that is mentioned, there's multiple staff that um, also have contributed to creating and empowering the learning environment. And we realize through this pandemic that this work can't be done in isolation and goes way beyond the walls of our school. And at this time, Dr. Blackman is gonna share a perspective of how the community has impacted the empowerment of students, staff, and each other. Thank you. Madam President, Board of Trustees, Leander family, before we jump to highlighting our incredible community, let's take a moment and define what community means to us. Our community includes our students, staff, families, and our district. We sit before you tonight as a direct reflection of the work and support of our families, which include the PTO board, community group, and community partners. We would be mistaken not to highlight the incredible partnership of our district. We are truly empowered by a district that provides the resources, support, and most importantly, the research and education to back the work that we are doing and our teachers and staff are doing to empower our students and to be in a position tonight to share with you some of the work that they are doing. Board of Trustees, at this time, we would like to draw your attention to the student bios that provide a brief glimpse of the action these students have taken as a direct result of their learning experiences at C.C. Mason IB World School. For the purposes of time, we will not share an in-depth explanation of the action taken, rather the perspectives of what empowerment looks like, sounds like, and feels like from our students. Hi, my name is Olive. When I realized there was an invasive species on the tree, it made me feel angry and sad for the tree. I wanted to help. Every time I came to the tree, I realized no one was helping the problem. So I decided to take action by spending my time researching on how to remove the mistletoe. Hi, my name is Vivi. Olive and I have always loved nature. When we were learning about invasive species, we noticed mistletoe all over our tree on the playground. We were empowered by the teachers by saying, look at the mistletoe and try to fix it. We, we, we realized no one was trying to save the tree. Since I had Olive, I knew we could do it. We realized there are so many obstacles to solving this problem, which made us want to solve it more. Hi, my name is AJ Patel, and I have been empowered by the atmosphere around the school because everyone is willing to help or try something new. Hi, my name is Joshua, and I have been empowered by my teachers because they encouraged me to keep writing books even when times get hard. They also have taught me many things about writing, and that has helped me the most. For example, they taught me what a run-on sentence was. <laughs> Hello, my name is Anae. I have been empowered by my teachers, especially my art teacher, Mrs. Day. 
My teachers have pushed me towards great opportunities like Quest, DI, and creating art. All these things empower me to be excited for school each day and to push myself to be a better student. Hi, my name is Natalie. I was empowered by how much hope and compassion the teachers had for me and how I was challenged by other students. Hi, my name is Anna. I've been empowered by students asking me questions and when teachers teach me new ideas and skills. It has helped me gain confidence to speak up more. Hi, my name is Sebastian. I have been empowered by my mentality because in my mind, I try hard to focus. Yes, I do days off, but I try very hard to make my dreams come true so that I can have the best life possible. Hi, my name is Renata. I have been empowered by many people. A few of them are my fellow classmates. They are always helping me when I am down and always helping me when I am confused. My amazing te I have also been empowered by my amazing teachers, Ms. Scott, Ms. Harvey, Ms. Diamond, and Ms. Bonham. They are always encouraging me to do things, but in particular, Ms. Bonham has been such a kind and encouraging teacher. Last but not least, my mom. She has always told me to stay positive and never give up on myself. Hi, my name is Paulette. I've been empowered by not giving up on something I thought was impossible, like winning an art contest, even if I thought I could, that I couldn't. I can have compassion by showing people to not give up when things are tough and keep trying. I have been empowered by sharing my ideas with others, like my classmates. Hi, my name is Alasia. I have been empowered by the teachers and staff. They don't judge and the kids here are amazing and they love to help. My learning is the best because we have built a community here in our hearts and in our school, CC Mason. I love my learning here. In conclusion, we want to thank you for taking a moment to celebrate our greatest asset, our people. Today, you see the direct results of a community our students, staff, families, district leaders, and valuable community partners coming together to accomplish goals of empowering students to take action with their learning beyond the walls of our school. Thank you. Good job. And I thank our board could tell who our parents were, but parents, can you stand up and our supporters who, who came out, our, our parent supporters for CC Mason. Thank y'all so much, parents, supporters, students. That was excellent. Very exciting. We will now move on to the next item of our agenda, the Custodian Appreciation Week and Child Nutrition Services Staff Appreciation Week. Um, this will be a video presentation, so I think they'll be rolling it shortly. Leander is the custodian. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing, maintaining the learning spaces clean and safe for all the students. The last uh, two years have been uh, difficult. The journey has been tough, but you're resilient and you're an example of teamwork when we need you the most. Our department, thank you. The administration of the schools and the administration of the school district, thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the child nutrition employees for their dedication and compassion as they serve the students of Leander ISD. These employees provide access to healthy and nutritious meals as is essential for every student, ensuring all students are well fed no matter their social or economic environment. From preparing thousands of school meals to navigating nutritional guidelines, dietary restrictions, child nutrition employees definitely have a lot on their plates. Thank you to all the Leander ISD child nutrition staff for the amazing job you do each day. All right, board members, we will go ahead and move on to our communication and uh, announcements. We'll start with our superintendent remarks. Is that superintendent or Dr. Atterbury? 
Dr. Gehring. No, I'm right here, up here, I think. Okay. Waving down at you. It's great that I can join you virtually, so thank you to our tech department for making sure this can happen. Um, it, it's really excellent to hear our Mason Elementary students talking about their passions and their interests and, and how excited they are about being empowered students. You're going to see that thread pull its way through as uh, we look at our career and technical education department report later on in the agenda today and how those passions at elementary school turn into community-based uh, certifications uh, later on and so that's going to be fun to watch um, it's also so important that we recognize our staff for the incredible work that they're doing uh, in our schools so our custodians and our child nutrition workers we're excited um, about how much they've done in the last two years especially but even now as they're short-staffed it's it's incredible the work that they're doing to help us out and we'll see some more of those recognitions coming out as we go through the evening's agenda. Thank you, Madam President. All right, thank you. Board members, are there any remarks? Day as we're walking through and we're talking to them and interviewing them they're like oh I don't have my hair done or my makeup on but they're there they're in the morning helping with cafeteria just helping with picture day and and you saw students sharing ideas and teachers encouraging you just saw all of those pieces when she talked about their IB school and it really being this perfect piece of students and teachers and community empowerment. You walk in there on any day of the week and it may not look all with your hair done and your makeup on, but it was, you could see all of those things happening just any day of the week. So it was really special to see. So I know a couple of us, or actually most of us, uh, got to attend the Festival of Bands on the 3rd of October, which was amazing. So great job to all the bands out there. And the final number, they all kept it together, which was amazing. So super proud of them. Um, I know that they've all um, competed in UIL this week. Um, they've all, they're all moving on to the next um, stage of UIL, which is fantastic. So great job to all of our bands and the directors and the techs and all the parents and all of the other people that make that happen. It's a big machine. Um, the next little piece I wanted to share was just something from personally, um, something that my kiddo shared with me from um, their aerospace class. So part of their assignment was to build an airfoil and they had to check it for drag and lift and um, speed and all of these other things. And I got to hear the excitement about that class and the teacher and how, how everybody did something a little bit different but they were all go going for s some different goals, but they were all building the same thing and how the shapes were different and why they were different. And just the engagement that's happening in our schools on a daily basis is fantastic. So I just wanted to share that little piece. Um, just hearing my kiddo come home excited about that and, and get, getting to see the, the, the airfoil in person after it was 3D printed and they got to put it in the wind tunnel. And it's just, it's just amazing. I think that all of these future space engineers are just loving this. So uh, it, it's just a fantastic thing. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, for the community, the fall, the fall shows for theater are happening this week and next week. So if you get a chance, go to your local high school, see these shows. These kiddos have put in a lot of time and effort into, you know, not just acting and singing and, and all of those things. It's the set building and the lighting and the sound and all of those things. It takes a, a village to make it work and it's just amazing to see what they can do. We're only, you know, a few weeks into school and they're already putting on a production. So I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a cheap date night. Um, so please, please get out there and support those kiddos. Thank you. 
Sorry, I was taking notes because I was busy. Um, so I'm going to work backwards. So it feels like a long time ago, but uh, between our last meeting and now, we had our first Empowering Parents School and Safety Community Forum, which I was super excited to attend and be there. Uh, it was live streamed, and the link is online. But I want to thank um, all of our law enforcement that were there and our partner, community partners that were part of a panel discussion. Um, just on the fentanyl crisis and school safety in general. And so it's a really good uh, presentation that's on the Facebook and website, and you can go back and watch it. Then we had a board cafe, then we had festival events, and then we had the community, um, the continuous improvement conference. And so I attended that um, Monday virtually, got to log in and watch Laurel Lynn present and do some things. And so it was really good uh, two days of learning and um, that and then I will be at the snow on Friday at Vista Ridge High School. So it's in my pants. Good. <laughs>
you to be mindful of your conduct. And the example you are choosing to set when presenting complex information, if you are presenting material that only certain high schoolers may encounter, remember that school children of all ages may participate in board meetings, either by watching them online or you might even come see some of us in the audience. <laughs> When the board president calls your number, remember, watch the timer and focus your remarks to the time allotted. We know it can be hard, but please include your, conclude your comments when you hear the chime. All right, speaker number one. Thank you school board members, Dr. Gehring, LISD teachers and staff, and the police officers who are here to protect us. I'd like to call special attention to the wonderful nurses who care for our students every day. Today, I am here to suggest the district reconsider policy on over-the-counter medicines. For example, the current policy does not work for students who suffer menstrual pain, which the Journal of Pain Research says affects up to 84% of all menstruating girls and young women. We are told medicine must be provided by parents or guardians, but it must be dispensed by clinics and there, there is zero tolerance. This leads to several concerns. First, some students or families may not be able to afford over-the-counter medicines. Second, the policy causes some students to have to suffer serious menstrual pain. This can have serious academic co consequences. Third, the policy requires students to take value valuable class time and this is not equitable. Fourth, there are reasonable alternatives like limiting the number of doses a student may have on hand. Fifth, LISD should consider taking donations to pay for medicines for families who can't afford it. Sixth, for privacy reasons, some students may, will avoid the clinic and are forced to suffer pain instead. Please do all you can. Please do all you can. This this issue probably affects around 18,000 LASD students. Thank you. All right, thank you. Speaker number two. I'll be reading tonight a statement by a concerned parent who wishes to remain anonymous, and you'll see why in a minute. This is from a few weeks ago. I had a conversation with my daughter yesterday about the books she had to choose from in her English class. My daughter informed me that the teacher was telling her whole class that almost all the books on the list are books that parents try to ban because they have LGBTQ characters in them, and that she went on an entire diatribe about her feelings on that. She then began telling the students something about what to do if they felt triggered. My daughter said she felt like she had to endure an entire inappropriate political speech during class. I am so livid about this, but also fearful to speak my mind publicly because I don't want my child to be targeted. I just, I'm just glad that we have lots of talks with our daughter about what's right and what is wrong and inappropriate and she lets us know when teachers make her feel uncomfortable. 90 seconds does not give me enough time to really go into what's wrong with that, all that's what's wrong with it. But I'll just, two things wrong, wrong with it. Number one, it's inappropriate in classrooms. Number two, it's a lie. I've been here two and a half years. I've attended every one of these meetings. It's never been about LGBTQ. It's always been about inappropriate sexual content, whether it's LGBTQ or heterosexual. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number two. Speaker number three. S 
Is it working now? Good evening, trustees. My name is Mike Sanders, and I'd like to say a few words tonight about uh, agenda item 8C1 regarding uh, Raider Way that goes up uh, in front of uh, Wiley Middle School and, and Rouse High School. The proposal is to take this two-lane road and widen it into a two-lane road. <laughs> with a middle turn lane, uh, which, and the middle turn lane, of course, doesn't do any good for anybody that's coming in from, from Crystal Falls on Raider Way trying to get into Wiley or trying to get into Rouse because the turn lane would be used if they were turning left. Well, they're not turning left. They're turning right. They're going into the schools. So, so the turn lane does absolutely nothing. So all of that money that's going to be spent to widen a two-lane road to a two-lane road is a waste of money. And I would like to propose that uh, LISD uh, consider giving some land right there uh, that, that's already owned by LISD between the tennis courts and the, and the road uh, to the city of Leander so that we can build a wider road with two lanes going in, in each direction. Two lanes, the existing road could be the two lanes that are southbound and a road between the, the, the huge uh, heritage oaks there and the tennis court could be a second, uh, two lanes going northbound. Perhaps we'd need to move the tennis courts a little bit, which is a, a minor expense compared to the amount of, of relief that would be given to thousands of Leander's families. And I wish that anybody considering this, this motion would just travel along Raider Way for five days, please, during rush hour. Thank you, speaker number three. Speaker number four. Good evening, my name is Paul Gautier. I've been speaking here for a while and you guys just can't help yourselves. You got the bonds down to 2.4 billion and yesterday you had to do a bond sell off because the bond market is imploding. So the new bond is 2.6 billion again. You guys do not know how to run a school district. You should not be the ones doing it. Every time I turn around, I find something new, and you guys are always involved. You're always finding new ways to sink the district. And bringing those kids up there again, this isn't what a district is supposed to be. This board isn't what the district needs. I have nothing else to say other than Thank you. Thank you, speaker number four. Speaker number five. Good evening, trustees. My name is Celeste. I'm a parent of students in LASD schools, two at Mason. That was, I made me so, so proud. Love that school. I know a lot is riding on our upcoming election up and down the ballot. As we knew it happened, the misinformation campaign is in full swing on props A and B, Ace and Vader. I've seen district community informational sessions set, shut down because some complain the district leaders are giving facts and they're not allowing an opposing view to factual information. There are people running for trustee seats out here touting blatant lies and misleading information in order to confuse the community, all while saying LISD is engaging in unlawful in electioneering. Imagine if they do get elected as a trustee, how would they treat that responsibility? I know you all have been working overtime to get the facts to the community, and most of us sincerely appreciate that. We can't let a few loud people running for seat at the table who clearly want to see our district destroyed and public education dismantled be louder than the facts. 
Per Psychology Today, psychological studies of both misinformation, which refers to any claims or depictions that are inaccurate, and disinformation, a subset of misinformation intended to mislead, are helping expose the harmful impact of fake news and offering potential remedies. But psychologists who study fake news warn it's an uphill battle, one that will ultimately require a global cooperative effort among researchers, governments, and social media platforms. So I implore everyone out there to get involved by having conversations with neighbors and friends and sharing information from the district on social media platforms all around. Thank you. All right, thank you, speaker number five. Speaker number six. Good evening and thanks. Um, I guess I'm the one that gets to wear a funny hat this evening. Um, I wanna encourage people to read it's unfortunate that some books are being banned, um, and I, I don't think we should be doing that. I also want to thank the young lady for bringing to all of our attention the medical needs of some of the young ladies that attend our schools. That's something you need to address right away. Um, I'm very proud, Fred and I both are very proud that we have a Texas marriage license. We're a gay couple that have been together for more than 12 years, and we have a Texas marriage license. Despite what anybody in this room may think or not think or feel or not feel about that. And we're gonna have that Texas marriage license forever, forever, despite what anybody likes about it. LGBTQ plus people pay taxes in this district. We vote in this district. We work in this district. And we have kids in this district that are being mistreated, bullied, violence is being done to them. Let's let them read those books, despite what anybody in this audience may say. Lastly, I'll tell you, there was a study that just came out, LGBTQ plus people, that's an increasing voter. More, more of those voters. All right, thank you, speaker number six. Speaker number seven. I'm sorry, speaker number seven, if you'll press the mic button so we can hear you. Hi, my name is Sean Leggy. I've been talking to a lot of voters and there's a ton of questions about uh, the Prop A and Prop B. It's very confusing to voters. Some of the things that are uh, being asked in the neighborhoods out there is, did they not plan for this? Why can't we use the $170 million we have in savings uh, for something like that? Uh, they're asking um, why we didn't see this coming. Uh, they're, they're asking why we continually are requested for more and more of our tax dollars, namely last year, $780 million, in addition to the over $400 million that we give you to educate our kids. And as trustees, the word implies trust given by the community to you for two major things. Number one, the education of our children, and second, as a fiduciary of our tax dollars. And as of last year, 2021, only 52% of the sixth graders could read on grade level. That's a failing grade for you, the trustees. It's been an abject failure of our trust. And as for threatening to fire 458 teachers, that's shameful. We all know you generate revenue by the kids that come, and we need teachers for those kids. You're not gonna do that, that rings hollow. You've been an abject failure of our trust. All right, thank you, speaker number seven. Speaker number eight. Uh, thanks to the board, uh, Superintendent Gearing, and especially the teachers and st staff of Leander ISD, you should be treated with the utmost, res utmost respect and gratitude uh, from parents and students who understand all you do. Uh, it's wonderful. This is, again, a call for conscience to conservatives, to moderates, to liberals, to really look at what's happened over the last year um, at the school board meetings, and especially the behavior of people who say that they are for decency and so on and so forth. You know, my daughter was driving over with me and said to me, you know, Christ, 
wants us to love all people. Now that's our religious views. Other people have other religions or none, and those decisions should be respected. But then there are some people who don't or have still other beliefs, and their beliefs are that their uh, religious beliefs, if you want to call them that, should allow them to abuse teachers, staffs, and students. And that's happened at this board from people who said that conduct was illegal, exposing kids to so-called porn, and then forced that on kids who were in the meeting or online over the course of about a year, and lots of other conduct like that. And so I would just like to say people should really evaluate very carefully. We had a person here talk about uh, something that happened with his daughter. I actually saved that person's wife's job. I don't actually believe what that person said. Um, and I just want to say I think that the kids are be much better behaved, and we should use them as a model for how we act. Thank you for all you do. All right. Thank you, speaker number eight. Speaker number nine. Speaker number nine. All right. All right. Well, this will close our citizen comments portion of the agenda. Okay. And we'll move on to our consent agenda. If there is no motion to sever, do I have a motion to approve? I move the consent agenda items be approved as presented. Second. I have a motion from Christine. Second from Alexis. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Five ayes, no nays. Motion carries. All right, we'll move on to the superintendent report. Thank you, Madam President. I believe uh, Dr. Otterbury is going to run my slides for me from there. Excellent. I love this picture because it represents uh, the Leander ISD leadership class of 2023 and the engagement and joy in these individuals as they work to get to know the district better and just understand what it is that we're doing so that they can be better community members is, is such an integral part of, of the work that we're doing um, in our community and our hashtag one LISD family. So we want to thank them for their participation um, and for everything that they're doing. We we'll talk a little bit about safe and innovative learning environments and start with our empowering parent a conference on safety, security, health, and wellness, our summit that we had recently, so you can go on there, Laura Lynn. Um, and at this summit, um, while we only had 20 people actually appear in person in the auditorium, uh, the way that we had set it up uh, allowed for 290 people to participate online, which was really great. Um, and then since then, we've posted that, of course, and I've had over 164 views of, of the recording. So. Um, it's good that we're reaching out to our community and, and helping others to understand how we're really promoting the safety and security um, in our district. Uh, we had an incredible turnout of uh, agencies who are partnering with us, and you can see them in these photos that have been on the screen, um, as well as, of course, uh, our own personnel who work so well on making sure that our students and our staff remain safe as we go through the learning day in the district. So let's move a little bit on to empowered student learning. And I've selected some pictures here to tell you some stories. And so this first classroom really tells you a little bit about the learning that's going on in our schools. This is a Driver Place Elementary School. And as you look more closely at this, you see you know, the student with his hand raised. And, and if you look carefully in his eyes, you can see that he's waiting his turn to get the attention of his instructor, of his facilitator, of his teacher. Um, and he knows that he's gonna get the attention that he needs. We've got students in the background who are working at their table in the small group. We've got a student standing over to the side um, taking care of her business. There's freedom in this classroom for them to move around um, and for them to really uh, meet their individual needs. This next one is from Leander Middle School. Yeah, right. And I want to point out that yeah. engagement doesn't always have to happen in a classroom and learning doesn't always happen just in the classrooms. Um, and so you can see the focus of this young man as he's really working on eye hand coordination, making sure that he can uh, pick up that wiffle ball in this game that's happening during their PE period. This next one, I just 
wish I knew what these two were talking about. Don't you wish you knew? It's so fun to think about the conversations that happen informally with our students that encompass so much of the learning that is going on in our schools on a daily basis that are not necessarily coming from direct instruction, but more from peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And that's true not just outside, but inside too. Um, just the joy that these students are experiencing as they're participating together in our cafeterias. We heard about uh, the staff in our cafeterias and the incredible work that they do to provide moments just like this for our students uh, at high levels of engagement. This next one is perhaps my favorite one of this whole deck. Uh, if you look closely, the learning here is intense. There is muscle memory happening here, there's balance, there's focus, there's determination. There are so many things happening, not least to say that that young man with his Stay Wild t-shirt on is just brings joy to my heart. And then there's middle school. And I don't know what to tell you, but middle school is a very special place. These students are engaged with each other. And it's hard to tell from this picture what they're learning, but I promise you they're learning at very deep levels. So let's talk about a little bit about how do we make all this happen? Well, there are some groups of people that we don't always pay enough attention to, and so I'd like to highlight a few of them. Um, and first is our payroll department. Uh, these are perhaps one of the most important teams in our district, because I, for one, certainly like getting my paycheck every month. And so we have Nicole Thomas in the back, um, and then from left to right, Suzanne Hansen, Stacy Lake, and Tamara Shepard. And not pictured in this group, uh, but part of this team as well is Mindy Rivera. And with all of our new hires and the terms and the changes and starting the new school year, it is really a huge task to make sure that everyone gets paid. To give you some example, um, I'll give you a breakdown up there of, of what the September payroll looks like. And it's not just one payroll, but broken up into four different payrolls. Um, and those payrolls total over $25 million uh, that we're working with our 5,300 employees. This week uh, was Texas Education Human Resources Day. And our staff cannot be empowered if it weren't for our HR department and the incredible work that they've done over this summer and this hiring season to make sure that we are fully staffed enough. I won't say we're fully staffed, but we're fully staffed enough to operate. Um, and they have done an absolutely incredible job. And so we want to give them a huge shout out and say thank you to them for what they've done. And then if you haven't been to photos.leanderisd.org and seen all the photos uh, that are, end up on our website and around the place, then you have to go visit there. That's where I steal mine from. Um, and these two are the ones who make that possible, Michaela Steiner and Daniel Sonero from our fabulous SCR department. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but the, the images that Michaela and Daniel are capturing really do capture the essence of our students and of the incredible learning that they're doing on a daily basis. So we want to thank them. But inside our classrooms, this is where the magic happens. And it's with individual teachers, like this one from Cedar Park Middle School, instructing a whole group. But you can tell from her face how much passion she has for the learning. Or this other teacher at Cedar Park Middle School who's engaging one-on-one -on -one with a student, making sure that their needs are being met and the focus on that individual case. The joy in this next one in a read aloud um, for her kindergarten students at River Place Elementary School, just so fun to watch. And the passion of making sure that every student is engaged and every need is met is clearly obvious in this picture. And so we want to thank our students for being empowered in their learning and for our staff 
for helping to empower them. The joy in our students' faces and in their hearts is one of the most important things that we can instill as we go through our learning days in Leander ISD. So thank you, Madam President. All right, thank you. That'll conclude our uh, superintendent report agenda item. We'll move on next to our discussion action item, students experience, um, career and technical education update. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Arterberry, Dr. Gearing. Um, tonight, uh, I have two guests with me, um, our amazing team, to talk to you about our career and technical education programs in the district. So with me tonight, I have our Senior Director of College and Career Transition Programs, Camille Clay, and I have our Assistant Director of Career Development, Jamie Everett. And I'm going to step back, hand it on over to them because they are truly the experts in this area. All right, got it? Okay, so uh, good evening. As uh, Krista stated, I am um, Camille Clay and we have Jamie Everett here and we're part of the team at Central Office that supports career and technical education in Leander ISD. And we want to thank you for the opportunity tonight to highlight our student experiences in current technical education. As we highlight some of our programs this evening, you're going to see the alignment to the LISD strategic plan um, and all of the different focus, uh, focus areas that are established by you, our board of trustees. Throughout the presentation tonight, you will see pictures of our students and facilities embedded in the presentation. We'd like to start this evening by talking about the major components of a high quality CTE program. The components you see here drive the daily work of our CTE staff and is the measure by which we evaluate our programs. All the components are supported in partnership with campus teams and district content specific professional learning communities and aligned to the strategic plan to create meaningful and authentic experience that empowers students to acquire the skills and meet the indicators of the graduate profile. Tonight's presentation will focus on the programs of study and industry-based certifications as they relate to college career and military readiness, or CCMR. As we look at the lens of equitable access, our CTE programs in Leander ISD provide a variety of opportunities for students to access and explore their interests and passions. This is evident by our programs, which include 193 courses for campuses to implement. Currently, we have 73% of the students enrolled in CTE and supported electives in grades nine through 12 in the district. A highlight here is an expansion of our middle school CTE and supported elective course offerings, which have increased from six to 26 offerings over the last three years. Another highlight is we expect to see our enrollment in our high school level courses continue to grow with the removal of the Profcom communication course requirement for ninth graders and changes to the GPA calculation and reporting system. All of these changes have resulted in increased opportunities for students to be empowered and engaged with their learning as seen here in the pictures. The 193 courses we talked about which we support within our department fall within 13 career clusters, which you're seeing here. I do wanna point out, we've talked a little bit about supported electives, so I wanna talk about just a little bit that English electives are programs that we support and ROTC, the junior ROTC program, are programs that we support, but they are not technically considered career and technical education by the state, all right? But we include them in all of our uh, literature. So within the career clusters, we will, uh, <clears throat> we will have 38 programs of study that students can choose from. What we wanted to do here is just highlight two career clusters and the programs of study that fall under them. 
As you can see, each of, the, each of the specific programs of study, what you can't see here is that each one of them has a coherent sequence of at least four courses within that program of study to ensure that students are prepared for in-demand, high-skill, and high-wage careers in Texas. All of our programs of study are aligned with the guidelines from TEA and high school graduation endorsement requirements. We do have comprehensive programming at our schools as well as specialized programming. And specialized programs typically can only be offered on select campuses due to facility requirements and staff qualifications. We have included a link um, in the presentation for you to go in and view all 38 programs of study that we offer. I do also want to point out that all the components within our programs are on a regular review cycle from the state, such as our TEKS, our coherent sequence course offerings, and our industry-based certifications are on either a two or four year typical uh, review cycle. TEKS are to be determined. <laughs> so with that, we'll take a look, uh, take a little bit deeper dive into one of our programs of study for healthcare therapeutics. This is an example of a flyer that we use to communicate and engage with our students, families, community, and industry partners to ensure that all stakeholders have a clear understanding of what our programs offer in Lander ISD. Every flyer provides a consistent structure of information, an overview, industry-based certifications, Texas labor market data, work-based learning, career and technical student organizations, and course sequence and endorsement choices. I specifically want to focus on two of components seen at the bottom of the first page that truly offer empowered student experiences through our, our programs, work-based learning and career and technical student organizations. Work-based learning intentionally connects student learning beyond the classroom to real-world industry experiences. Some current examples of work-based learning that we offer in Leander ISD include guest speakers, webinars, industry panels, mentorships, portfolio reviews, school-based enterprise services, on-site field trips, industry collaborative projects, internships, and externships. Leander ISD currently supports nine career and technical student organizations, also known as CTSOs. A CTSO is an extracurricular group offered to students in a CTE pathway to further their knowledge and skills by participating in activities and events leadership development and competitions at local, state, and national levels. We always enjoy celebrating successes of our students in these CTSOs with you each spring and want to thank you, board, for your continual support of these extracurricular activities. This flyer, in, with addi um, in addition to all program of study flyers, um, course, uh, course recommended course sequence flowcharts and student experience videos for every program of study can be found on our CTE website. In continuing to look at each of our programs of study, industry-based certifications, known as IBCs, empower our students to leave Leander ISD with a documentation of industry-aligned knowledge and skills that give them a competitive advantage for higher education and career opportunities after they leave us um, after high school. Leander ISD currently pays for student opportunities to test and earn certification, and we complete an annual state reimbursement process to help financially support these efforts. TEA has created a vetting process that we use to identify and align approved industry-based certifications to each of our programs of study, including the certifying entities that we select from. Um, and they uh, provide us with a state list for which IBCs are in included in state accountability for college, career, and military readiness measures. Leander ISD currently offers 59 industry-based certifications, 46 of which count on the state accountability list. Let's take a closer look at the chart that you see on the slide this evening. The total bar indicates all IBCs earned in a given academic school year. The blue bar represents those that are included in the state accountability list. The yellow bar represents all additional IBCs that we offer in Leander ISD, most of which are safety certifications that employers require for entry-level employment. We're excited to share that in uh, the 21-22 academic school year, 2,955 certifications were earned by our students with an overall 89% pass rate. We also celebrate that our students have succeeded pre-pandemic levels of attainment in this area. 
A couple additional data points to note on the chart. If we look at the 1920 academic school year dip in the data, um, this is a result of the student transition to virtual learning during our biggest testing window of the spring semester due to the start of the COVID pandemic. In the same year, you see an increase of the blue bar. This is a result of TEA changing their state list for which certifications count for state accountability during that year, increasing the number of certifications that counted on that list. The state list is evaluated every two years with the most recent list just having um, been released in September. There is a current draft proposal to change how industry-based certifications and programs of study count in college and career readiness measures for state accountability. We um, are happy to keep you updated as we receive confirmed information from TEA. Student learning and industry-based certification preparation are not only supported by our rigorous curriculum and, and, and opportunities, but also by our innovative learning environments equipped with industry standard technology and equipment. This slide showcases a few of our many innovative learning environments across the district. Not only do our students have the opportunity to engage in these lab spaces, but their learning environments extend past the classroom to many internship sites in our community. Beyond programs of study, we're working to increase access and opportunity for student awareness and exploration of career options earlier in their K-12 experience so that students are empowered to make better choices around their programs of study once they reach high school. Our entrepreneurship program is a great example of an innovative program expansion that is now threaded through our district grades 5 through 12. I'd like to, at this time, um, thank LEAF for all of their continual financial support for student projects at every level of this program. I'd like to circle back to our components of a high qualified CTE program experience. None of the things that we have shared tonight would be possible without our amazing teachers and campus administrators. Oftentimes, CTE teachers are the only one on a campus teaching a particular course. They're supported through a cross-district program of study PLC and facilitated by a lead teacher who serves as a content expert. Intentional efforts are put into empowering our teachers to stay connected to each other and engage in content learning, which includes opportunity for program-specific professional learning. We want to thank you for supporting district professional learning opportunities in the academic calendar that allow for this cross-district collaboration. Next, we would like to share some of our student pathway experiences. Our first student, and, and, and really their post-secondary journey after they leave us, Jenna Thomas is a recent graduate from Cedar Park High School who participated in the health science program. She graduated with three safety certifications in first aid, CPR, and OSHA 10 for healthcare. In addition, she earned a specific skills certification as a certified clinical medical assistant and ultimately was hired this past spring as a patient care technician at Ascension. Jenna was offered a signing bonus and full benefits right out of high school. Upon graduation, Jenna planned to continue her education at Austin Community College while majoring in nursing and continuing her employment at Ascension, building upon those skills. The second individual that we would like to um, share with you is Shantae Jefferson. She participated in our Ready, Sit, Teach program at Cedar Park High School and interned at one of our LISD elementaries. Upon graduation, Shantae attended the University of St. Thomas in Houston. The picture on the right shows Shantae as one of our Ready, Set, Teach student interns with her mentor teacher, Katie Travis. And the picture on the left shows her now as a teacher coach at Rouse High School. Shantae stated, that having the opportunity to come back to Leander ISD after participating in the Ready, Set, Teach program was definitely full circle. The program helped solidify that I wanted to pursue becoming a teacher. I'm thankful for the mentorship of Katie Travis that persisted through my college years and now into my teaching career. We would also like to thank our HR department for working with our Ready, Set, Teach students and guaranteeing program completers an interview upon attaining their educational credentials. The third individual is Jesse Beckett. Jesse is a 1994 graduate from Leander High School and participated in the electrical trades program. 
Upon graduation, Jesse was hired by one of, the industry, one of our industry partners and enrolled and completed a registered apprenticeship program and obtained his journeyman and his master electrician's license. Jesse will also tell you he was able to complete that four-year apprenticeship program in three years because he was able to test out of the third, first year of that curriculum due to his high school coursework. In 2003, Jesse founded a commercial electrical service company, which currently employs over 100 in individuals in the Austin area. Jesse has most recently served as the chair of the local chapter of Associated Builders and Contractors and credits Leander High School electrical program for helping launch his career. These are just a few examples of how students have graduated with marketable skills, pursued a variety of post-secondary edu education opportunities, and made meaningful industry connections on their pathway toward a successful career. Thank you so much for allowing us to share a few highlights of the career and technical education program tonight. Do you have any questions? Board members? No questions, just great job. I think, you know, it's a, it's an impressive program and y'all know that I'm big fans of the CTE program. Um, so just really, um, I think it's impressive not only to inspire students in something that really is interesting and that they're passionate about, but then an area that they can also make a career in. and. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful program, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> so it has more to do about discoverability. I mean, you did mention that there was a 73% high school participation, um, and there were increased offerings in middle school. I did see on the website that there is an offering in elementary school, but it's about um, letting how parents and students know that these options are available and are there any barriers that are preventing some of them from participating? Because every now and then I get questions about some of the programs and then I look on the list and I'm like it's there. And it's like people don't know about some of these. So are you finding that to be an issue? I, mean, I would say that Jamie has really been working very specifically like on the flyers, the videos. We meet with counselors on a regular basis, uh, trying to get more information out there through our website. Um, that was really a goal of ours a couple of years ago was to really work on the marketing material because we were hearing that some people didn't know. Um, so it, it, it's always something that we can improve upon. Thanks. I'm curious about um, what the experience might be like for a student or parent as they're working through the brochure or, or the programs that are listed here in the book. And before I go through that, I want to say this is amazing. I mean, y'all have been working steadily and just echoing what Gloria said to go through this and see all the different opportunities and career uh, technical opportunities that are available to our kiddos is amazing. I want to take just one out for an example and look at STEM. And there's a recommended course sequence under STEM for cybersecurity. Now, this is just one example. You don't have to tell me all the courses. I'm not going to ask you because there's a lot of courses. I love that. But as I'm looking at it, there's a level one, a level two, three, four. Do we anticipate that when students work with their counselor that they'll be able to access all these courses? Or how does that experience work as they're trying to navigate through? Because there's, there's a lot of courses here, but there might be one, say, at another campus. So can you help me understand what that experience might look like for our parent, our student? So, um, to, to answer that question, we work closely with counselors and campus administrators when they are making um, course enrollment sheets or program selection for what is a best fit for that campus in terms of the student interest on that campus, the staffing um, capacity that they have on the campus for offerings. So while some courses, all of the courses in that list may not be offered on every campus, we can guarantee that if a campus offers the programs of study, four of those courses, one course at each level, is 
is offered, um, and that is we closely work with the uh, counseling services on that in the administration to make those selections to make sure that we offer a full coherent sequence on campus where that program of study is offered. Excellent. That sounds like a good way to use the resources, but also yes. as long as we're getting the word out. So that's excellent. Um, I have a few other questions that I'm fine not getting them this evening, but I'd like to have more discussion on it. Um, you indicated CCMR and kind of those discussions that I've also been hearing as well, but there might be some changes. I understand that there might be a publication out. October 30th is the, the time when some of this information will be published. Um, but would you all be able to, if you know information before it's public, um, if, if you have things that you're, you're like, oh, we need to let the board know, when you send it to us, will you include the things that you think are successes and then the things that might be opportunities uh, for just to kind of give us some parameters on the information? Because when we're in different legislative discussions or when I'm at a CTSBA meeting, it's important to know kind of where our district um, is impacted or not on some of the, the things that are coming out. So I'd appreciate um, if we could get stuff to the board because I think everybody's kind of involved in different conversations at different levels. Um, and then also at some point, when we were at CTSBA, we were discussing workforce. I don't know, it almost seems like we timed it. But um, the um, industry-based certifications, there were so many trustees discussing it, but then a question came up of, wait a minute, is that the same thing as licensure? Like, do they have the hours? Do they have the training? And so I would love to know more, just a little bit of a deep dive there on our industry-based certifications and the licensures. Do we, do we offer licensures or how far can we get students in certain licensures um, to kind of help us expand? And that doesn't have to be tonight. Again, y'all gave us a huge, beautiful overview of all the amazing offerings. And there are so many and I'm, picking down here on one that I'm just kind of curious about. Um, but don't worry, I have enough homework to go through all the material you've given me for a while. So um, those are my questions. We would be happy to follow up on those items at the end. We can provide more details. I just want to say thank you. Um, I think it was a really great presentation. I'm going to share it with Representative Wilson because he asked a lot of these questions at our legislative summit. So I'll be passing this information along. But I also want to say, um, have we talked about in your department, open houses for transitional years so we can talk about these programs and services. I think that's really critical where we partner with parents and families and explain the choices. And so um, I just want to continue that work and that partnership and that we get those information um, in the, when they're making their selections in the spring, parents don't really know what their children are picking and how that impacts their future. And so I hope we're continuing to look at that as an option. That's one of the beauties of the team that I get to work with is that I have uh, not only we have a counseling team, but we have our CTE team, we have our advanced programs team. And so one of the great collaborations that we can do is how do we support our campuses and our families during those times. So absolutely, we'll continue to work on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Lots you. of work here. Thank you so much. We're really excited. All right, we will go ahead and conclude that agenda item, move on to the next item under student experience, the long range planning school of choice survey results. That would be me again, so <laughs> good evening. Um, I also have uh, Dr. Benz with me tonight and we are thrilled to come to you this evening to talk about our Schools of Choice survey results. And so um, we're really going to talk about what were the results from our community survey and our student questionnaire. I'm going to take a moment to take us back a few months. Um, so over the spring, we were working with the, uh, the Long Range Planning Committee through the board um, to really look at our 10-year plan. And in those discussions, Schools of Choice kept coming up. And so we started our School of Choice core team to really research what could possible schools of choice look like in Leander ISD in the future. And in that research, that core team recommended or brought forth seven possible ones that they wanted to take out to the community to get input. Um, in July, we took those seven to principals, um, got their and other administrators in our leadership retreat, got their input, brought that to you, and said that our next step was to go out to community and students. And so that's where we are in the process, we have gone out to both the community and the students. 
And so we want to talk a little bit about participation in our community survey. In our community survey, we had 263 respondents. And um, we did have it open between August 31st and September 20th. So to talk a little bit about how we prepped our community for this, we presented in July, I believe it was like the July 21st board meeting. When we presented in July, immediately after our presentation that very next week, we've been working very, very closely with our school and community relations department on this. They released um, a, a article on our latest school of choice, our early college high school school to uh, highlight that and the summer bridge program and some of the great things that have been happening there and um, its inaugural year and then when we released the survey on August 31st we did a social media blast which included uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram we also had it on our website we uh, launched another kind of newsletter that went out we made sure it was on the face of our website and then we also launched our own school of choice page on our website and so what that page had was our current options for schools of choice and then the options that we were looking for as possible schools of choice in the future and then in addition to that we also sent it out in our compass newsletter so that anyone who receives that had an opportunity to participate in our survey as well um, and then as we were talking, we were like, man, we need some student input, but who are the right students to get this input from? And so as we were thinking about of the seven, um, several of the seven schools, possible schools of choice or proposed schools of choice included some high schools. Um, there were some kind of middle school options in there and some elementary. And so as we started thinking and working with some principals, we, the, they really suggested, how about we look at our fourth and fifth graders? Because it made sense by the time you go through choosing a school of choice and getting it to come to fruition and construction you these these kiddos would be the ones who might actually be able to attend one of these high schools should you choose to do that and so we partnered with our schools and created a questionnaire uh, for our fourth and fifth grade to get their feedback and we had over 2,500 uh, respondents on that so we were really excited and thankful um, to not only our campus leadership for uh, partnering with us on it but for the kiddos for taking that survey and so that was open September 19th through the 29th and so when you see student survey results it's from our own students our own fourth and fifth graders so when we think about what was the process in which we um, had them uh, do the schools of choice it's um and i was looking i was like i think we're missing the video or is it the next oh, one there's no video. i was like we had a video debut that's why i'm like where's our video we had a video debut on this um we weren't going to play it don't worry <laughs> but uh dr benson and i decided to be some youtube stars for our fourth and fifth graders because we wanted to know how were we going to get their um attention um, and have them understand what schools of choice were and we knew that that was going to be a big thing for both the community and for the students what What's the understanding of what a school of choice is and how will they know more than just on descriptions or words on a page how to rank them and so um, we were going to rank possible schools of choice options you had to rank your first choice as number one and your last choice as number seven um, for the community survey uh, the um, actual survey had embedded in it a definition of schools of choice and then each one of these schools of choice was listed with a description um, and then for the student schools of choice, they also had a kid-friendly description in their survey, but before they started that, they got to see the video that Dr. Benson and I created. And with that video, um, Michaela and our SCR department did a really great job of splicing in some really great pictures. So when I read the descriptions, we had, uh, not only were they able to hear it from me, they were able to see a description on the side and they were actually able to see sample pictures of schools um, as well to give them an idea of how they were going to rank that. Um, and so, uh, those were those were kind of what we did with this with the students but with the community the other thing that was really important was that school of choice website we really uh, pointed them back to that in that survey if they wanted some more information and so oh there's 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 our lovely video there you can see some of the pictures on the left hand side and then the descriptor of the school on the right as I was talking about health professions high school there and so that just gave the students an idea 
on our School of Choice website where the community could go to, you see an option for our current Leander ISD Schools of Choice and then our possible Schools of Choice options. We just took a snapshot of the top part of it so you can see what uh, the STEM high school uh, look like, but you would see a description and then you would see examples. We didn't necessarily put exemplars, but we put examples that we found of that type of school from either nationally or within our state so that people could go explore and get a feel for what would this particular school look like and have an idea before they actually submitted their survey. All right. And just another shout out to Michaela Steiner and the SCR team and Shannon Lombardo because I think the video does make us look pretty cool and it has a really professional description and photos of School of Choice and so they pretty much work miracles, <laughs> at least with me. So I'm excited to talk about the, um, the results uh, from the student questionnaire and the community survey and right off the bat I just want to tell you the low score wins. So with our weighted average results, uh, the low score represents the top choice. So the way weighted average works, um, and by the way, these are the student and community um, results combined. The next slide will dig in a little bit on the students and then the community um, separately. But the way the weighted average works is, so as the respondents rank, um, each of the seven possible schools of choice options, like Krista told you, from their first, what they think is the best number one option, down to number seven, um, the, this, their uh, choices get weighted. So for every time that a respondent picks one first, for instance, the STEM high school, they pick that as their number one top choice, it receives one point. And so when they you know, have the second choice, that's two points, their third choice on, on the survey gets a weight of three points, and then you add all the points together, divide it by the number of respondents, and you get the results. And so the lowest um, number is the top choice, and I don't know if I made that clear as mud, <laughs> but with the weighted average, the ones on the left represent the top choices. So the STEM high school was the top choice overall, um, the preferred option overall, the number one preferred option. The Fine Arts Academy for grades K through eight was the uh, second most preferred option overall for the students and community combined. And then you see the, um, the uh, school with a design thinking instructional model um, as the third choice and fourth choice health professions and so on and so forth. When you look at the student results and the community results um, separately, You'll see with uh, 2,500 respondents, the student choices uh, had, had a heavy impact on the combined total. And you see where the community results are slightly different. Um, you'll see that they had ranked health professions second, whereas our students really liked that K-8 Fine Arts Academy, apparently for their younger siblings, because we explained to them by the time these schools got built, um, high school would, the high school options would be a choice. Um, so it's just interesting where, where the community results come in and versus those student results um, right there. So we also asked the community members in their survey about willingness and or ability to, to travel um, to, to transport their students to a school of choice. So if you look at that top orange wedge, you'll see that there were 27% of those 263 um, community member respondents uh, indicated a willingness or an ability to travel um, up to 20 miles to uh, transport their students to a school of choice. Um, an additional 40, almost 41%, 40.7% of the respondents said they could uh, see themselves taking their kids up to 10 miles um, to, to attend one of the school of choice options. And then an additional 17.5% um, said that they could travel up to five miles. So that's 85% of the respondents said they could travel um, up to that five mile mark. Uh, in, very important to note though that 11.4% of our community member respondents said that um, they would, without transportation being provided, uh, their students would not be able to take advantage of the opp opportunities presented by these possible school of choice options. 
So we knew um, that it would be important to share the, the results uh, from our community and from our students relative to the seven possible schools of choice options. Um, as you are preparing for uh, your, your board workshop on the demographic report. So we wanted to provide you with this information um, as you make important decisions and recommendations uh, for the future of our district. And with that, we open it up to discussion. Board members? My question has to do with the sample size or the response. Because um, I was looking at the the most recent climate survey versus this one, and I was just wondering if, because it's two, 263 is a small number compared to over 6,000 parents. Sure, and I we definitely would have liked a lot more. Um, what Krista didn't mention is with that initial news story about early college high school, there was a method to, um, remember we highlighted it here with the board, which was wonderful, and then when SCR did the news story, they um, put a teaser in there about uh, possible schools of choice that the board would be considering in the future, and at that point started the messaging around uh, the survey that would be coming out to community members. And then I do wanna just give a, a third shout out to SCR because they put it out on every possible media um, source that we could think of and have come to you and presented information. I am not sure, aside from maybe a radio or TV uh, spot, how we could have communicated it more. I would like to get more information from our community. Um, I would submit that um, student voice is, uh, is very important. And we've kind of, in everything we've all done, and when I say we, you all as well, have done over the last three years, we've really um, emphasized more and more that, that student voice. And so when we were gaming out the idea of asking students and then to get 2,500 students involved and the principals so excited about um, students being asked, our students, they reported to us, the students were just really fired up about just being empowered to give their opinion and being told, I told them in the video that, you know, depending on how many of you do it, you could very well be making, basically making some important choices about what, what gets offered. Um, and so I, I think that 2,512 students speaks volumes. If there is another way to get more respondents, um, we're all about it. But this is, this is where we're at, and um, so. I mean, I may have missed it, but did it make it into the principal and teacher s'mores and also um, some of the people who have left the district but are still in, this, in the area might be able to provide some input as well? Not sure about the s'mores. I don't know if it was in the individual s'mores for the campuses. It was out in the Compass newsletter, and it was open to anyone in the community. So it was not just parents or current people working in the community. We even, I believe, had um, an indicator for if you were a parent and then a separate if you were a community member. And so um, we did open it up to everyone. Yeah, I was disappointed with the respondents. I knew I shared it. I pushed it. I, you know, I kept seeing it, telling people you have this many days left. Um, I don't know. I think we feel like we're all getting inundated with so much information sometimes that, you know, I don't know what's the way to, to like get input anymore, right? Because it just feels like, um, you know, maybe. Christina will give us all the answers someday, <laughs> but uh, she's like, no, but I, I do appreciate, I saw it everywhere. I, you know, I saw y'all um, sharing it and posting it in all the places. I just, um, I think we're seeing this in lots of different spaces. I think our PTAs and, and different groups are telling us a lot of the same, like getting that type of feedback right now. I don't know if it's just, we're, everyone's asking a lot of information right now and so people are like maybe give me a second you know 
I think what's interesting is even with the low number of respondents in the community survey, that the top spot for the community survey and the top spot for the student survey was the same, and by far the same on both. Um, and so I think that is, even though there was a low number of respondents, there is something to be said that the number one spot on both coincided, it was the same one. And so I do think that that at least gives us an indicator of kind of the primary uh, thought and choice of our students and community. I agree, and I think that that 2,500 respondents from students um, is is the most powerful indicator that we could gain, right? Um, I would not want to move my students to a specific school that they didn't want to be at, right? I mean, you're sending you're sending your student and driving your student however many miles because your student is passionate about this. So um, when I say disappointed in the community results, that's by like, yes, but I think the biggest celebration here is, you know, those respondents from our students because that's, that's what matters here. And to help make sure I've, I've got the right information that I'm sharing with the community, this is not fully, um, um, fully enacted, right? Like we don't have all the pieces in this. I'm trying to think of the right word to say that, but we don't, we don't know how students end up choosing to go are the selection criteria. We're not really sure what the transportation is going to look like. We haven't had the expectation discussion with our community and the board yet. Um, and I'm seeing nodding, so great, because that's what I thought too. Yes. Uh, so when does that kind of expectation part come? I mean, will that come before more is discussed in this, or can you help me understand more of that bigger picture? So what we really wanted to look at was what were the programs of interest first, because we need to know that, and then we need to know willingness to travel, because that will give us some ideas of if I'm going to take STEM high school because it was the top one. Um, for STEM high school, what is the willingness to travel? And it was a small number of respondents, so maybe we need to look into that a little bit more. But then that would allow us to know things like where might we want to locate a school like this if we choose to do it? Where might, right? And so you have a lot of these conversations. What we wanted to do is primarily provide the board with the programs of interest right now for these schools of choice as you move into um, uh, your next steps with the demographers report that will come out later on in November so that you can have this information already as you're thinking through that process and not wondering about it um, and then as we continue to move through should uh, the board choose to move forward with um, uh, one or more than one of these schools of choice, then that's where we'll start moving into developing some more of those details, including things like that means we will have multiple schools of choice in the district, so what do we desire for our processes for transportation, mm -hmm. for our processes for um, enrollment and selection for these? What And so then that's when that work starts to um, get become a little bit more robust. I know uh, we've had a trustee talk about, let's talk about policy around on these pieces and so that's where that next step comes so once we've moved forward and said okay do we want to do this and if so which ones then we can start having those conversations around policies surrounding our multiple schools of choice and then uh, specifics around the individual programs that's awesome I didn't even have to ask it and you answered it so I'm gonna just do that I'm just gonna think and you can just keep answering no thank you that that's very helpful I know policy is going to be very important on those future next steps that we're talking about. CFAC, tell me how does CFAC get this information and how do we see that weaving in? Because we have a lot of different, a lot of different pieces So moving. actually, Dr. Benson and I sat down yesterday and uh, we submitted some dates to, or maybe it was two days ago, we submitted some dates to our CFAC leads. And so what we'll be doing is we will be attending both the, well, all three, the elementary, middle school, and um, high school CFAC committees, um, each one of them in their charter has something about schools of choice um, as recommended by the board so what we're gonna do is just have um, some initial conversations with them about what are schools of choice and give them this feedback and then any questions they may have as um, more information comes through demographers report things of that sort as as we still develop the processes then there's opportunities for them to ask us to come back so that we can have more in-depth conversations with them from there and I would just ask as we move forward Y'all are kind of the hub between CFAC and board. And I think it's important to make sure we manage 
all expectations because we did have some of our community work on and, and, and you'll remember some program choices mm -hmm. and then they brought it back to the board and there was discussion of where's the finance for it and and I, I think the community who worked so hard on that probably thought, wow, what really, what happened as a result of my time? Mm -hmm. Now, I know we're still building off of that information, but I think for CFAC, it's important as they're having conversations, they know what their conversations, what they can or what, what will they say that they have room to do. And then as board, what did CFAC already decide, but where's our area? So I just think that's important that we continue to navigate that well, because there are a lot of pieces moving. Um, in, in a growing district with all the different parts moving. I know we've all got to have different conversations and sometimes it seems the same conversations, but I wanna make sure that we don't overwork each other. Yes, we are definitely working very closely with um, Jimmy and the CFAC committee as we talk through this process and then Dr. Bentz, myself, Dr. Otterberry, um, and then Mr. Disler are, are all on that long range uh, uh, committee together with some of our board members and so uh, we've kind of put all of our heads together to make sure that that communication is tight between all phases and I do want to say that that work that um, our community members did quite a while back where they recommended different programs this is part of that work um, this is where this work started was way back then and so when they think about what happened this is what happened we're still right. moving that's forward right. with your work that's what I was gonna say big ups to the program advisory committee because we're still <laughs> grinding away at it <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if we had told them before your expectations are we're still going to discuss it <laughs> in 2022 but but there was a lot of good work and so I'm glad we're still moving forward thank you all so much yes, thank, thank you. you all right all right we will move on to our next agenda item um, to governance the TASA TASB convention debrief board members when we go to convention and we go to these sessions we think oh my goodness wouldn't it be great if we could share with each other and so this just gives us an opportunity not to uh, necessarily feel like you need to go through all your lessons or all your learnings because my goodness the board meeting can only be so long but is there a highlight or something that you think is beneficial for discussion or just to get other trustees on their radar so that's what this is. If you look, there's some sample questions there to consider about any one of the, the trainings. It can be one or two or three. So there you go. So I'll, I'll jump in. The, uh, I was able to attend a couple of um, really interesting ones about our LGBTQ community, um, about transgender students, about the policies around um, making sure that we are supporting those students and how it works with Texas law. Um, it was really interesting to be able to hear from students directly. Um, there was a kiddo and, um, and his mom. Um, I don't know that there was a dry eye in the room by the time it was over. I mean, it's one thing to talk policy and it's one thing to talk about what if this and what if that, but when there's a name and a face and a family to it, it sure brings it home. And so I will say that was a, a very um, interesting one for me. Um, the, the other one I'll share um, was the very last one I attended um, about um, teen suicide. And we know that that is a huge, huge issue. Um, I know that it's, it's hit home for me um, just at a local campus level. And so there's a, a program that I was actually able to share with Mr. Clark, um, Steve Clark, our head of um, counseling, um, about a peer-to-peer a, a -peer program that was started in the state of Utah that was fascinating to me. It's called the Hope Squad. And um, kids, in, when kids are in crisis, they tend to talk to each other. They don't necessarily, you know, we always say, oh, go find a trusted adult. Go, you know, tell a parent, tell a teacher. They talk to each other first. And so this program was really fascinating to me. Um, I did share the information that I was able to glean from it with Steve and some links and things like that. So I, I, I do intend to follow up with him on that to see if maybe we can pilot it. Um, I would love to, I think it would be amazing. Um, believe it or not, it was started in the state of Utah who had one of the highest teen suicide rates um, in the entire country. And so um, to, to hear the success of the program that they have had and that, you know, it, it, it's worth it if we can save one. And so um, it was really interesting to me to hear the peer-to-peer the, the -peer side and how they, they train each other to listen. It's not necessarily the, what do I do if? It's, okay, I'm hearing something. Now I'm going to go find that trusted adult for this person that shared this with me. And so it's not a... 
It's not a tattletale thing. It's nothing like that. It's more of a, hey, the Hope Squad is there if you're feeling down, if you're feeling low. If they might notice something about somebody that maybe a teacher has got you know, 30 kids in their class, a peer is going to notice that something's off. And so it was really, it hit home. Again, another, probably not a dry eye in the room. Um, but I think those are the two, the two takeaways for me was kind of really understanding where our kids are. We, are, we, we talk about mental health, we talk about mental health, we talk about mental health, but let's get to the root of what are they really saying? What are they really doing? How can we, how can we get there and make sure that we're really listening? So those are the two takeaways for me for the weekend. Um, of course, lots of other things and, and panels and things that we all, a lot of us attended together, but um, for me, those are the two biggies. Thank you. I was there and I didn't get to see y'all as much as I wanted to. Um, I did, uh, this was my first session with Leadership TASB and um, this is something that continues throughout the year and when we meet, we meet for four days. Um, so I was there on, I got there on Thursday and uh, but it was interesting, you know, I realized once we got there, you don't really go to a lot of the conference. You're all kept together in this one room the entire time and they bring lots of different sessions to you and um, it was really valuable because they also give you a lot of opportunities to share and learn from other school districts across the state of Texas and um, and there's just so much to learn from each other and we don't always get that kind of time where you can, we're gonna to be together the whole day and we're gonna talk about this issue and oh wow, that's that's how you do it in your district. And you know, sometimes it's just hearing how, um, how other districts are addressing challenges or how they're also celebrating students and just, you know, in, in lots of different ways. We talked about policy and how policy is, how it's, enacted and what are the implications of various policies as as we're seeing them across the state um it was like i said great conversations with you know school board trustees from across the state talking a lot about um what it is to serve right now as a trustee and um that there is a lot of important work that needs to get done right now and sometimes a lot of um, wedge issues that are not are not trusty issues they then they shouldn't be school board issues are being like pushed in from community or just you know other characters and how do we how do we as a board and how do we get back to hey we have business here and we need to focus on our business and not get consumed by artificial issues, you know, our, or national issues that are not issues that we're going to be, <laughs> be taking part in. Um, so it was, it was wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the next session. You know, I think we meet again in a month. Um, yeah, and I think I was like, oh, where's the next one? It's in Huntsville. And I was like, okay, you know, and, but it's, um, it's, an opportunity to then also visit different schools and different school districts across the state. Um, I would highly encourage my other trustees that haven't done it before um, to look into it. And it's, I know you pushed me for a while and encouraged me and I thought, oh, that's a big obligation. It's a big commitment. I'm gonna take a lot of vacation days from work and, um, and I'm glad that you encouraged me to apply um, as a, I'm really excited about the experience. My, my hope is, is that eventually our whole board will get to go through that. Um, but it, it is, it's a big commitment of time. Um, I remember when I did it, it was so fulfilling though to be able to go and see different campuses. And I was excited because it's like, oh, we're doing this. And then it'd be like, well, we're not doing that, but that's because our campus is different. And so you, you, you got to like, it was, it was that experience, right? The experiential and getting able to network with other trustees. I am so glad you're getting to do that have like you know they're introducing their school district and they're talking about this amazing thing they do and it's like how many students do you have again and they're like <laughs> 800 and yeah. I'm like 
800 in like that school and they're like no 800 in the district and i'm like okay yeah so maybe we can't do that yes. yeah yes our i remember one time i went to breakfast and i was wearing a shirt and they said is that your high school colors and i was like what's well, one of them so yeah it's it's an interesting dynamic to be able to have those discussions so Thank you for dedicating that time. I think it makes our district better. Our students um, benefit from it ultimately. So thank you. Um, I do have two small learnings, but one I wanted to have just a small conversation about. One of my learnings was I was just amazed at how we have all these trustees from across Texas. And we're talking urban, suburban, rural. I mean, it's all different backgrounds, different types of schools, sizes. And we're all coming together to talk about the legislative initiatives. Like, what do we as trustees say we want to have as our legislative initiatives? And I'll go ahead and tell you one end of the story is all of the ones our board worked on were adopted. So y'all can rest there. So yay. Um, but what was really interesting was the discussion about mental health, emotional health for students. Because I understand there can be maybe confusion when some people use maybe words SEL or somebody says mental health. It's like, wait, are we doing counselors? Or how does all this work together? But what was really interesting is during delegate assembly, you had trustees from all over the state talking about the impacts to kiddos who were not in school for a period of time. And that leaves an impact on them. And so these trustees, it was really remarkable to see coming together from all different sorts of background, going, we know our kiddos went through an experience and they're not gonna be able to just necessarily hit the ground running and expect them to be right back to part A in two months or four months. Like there needs to be time and acknowledgement that we're we're, we're kind of emotionally all healing as we move forward. And I, I thought that was a really powerful discussion um, to be in the room to be able to hear that. Uh, my other discussion that I, I really thought was interesting, and it's kind of dovetails into that, was that A through F accountability. And um, there's a study that's gonna be coming out. I think they're releasing it, is it next week? I'm sure it'll be in our board memo when it finally comes out. But there's that discussion of how do we really measure what matters? And the more the discussion kind of laid out, like how are we measuring what matters, I, I have to say I got a little bit all excited because they talk about local accountability. And that is something that our district, I feel, is already positioned for um, with our community-based accountability system. So it'll be interesting to see as these surveys come out, like really, you know, see how do we really align? Are we really measuring some of these things? They had some suggestions and, and had done surveys all across Texas to talk about what are kind of your whole student well-rounded indicators are. So it'll be interesting to see how we match or don't or what did our community choose. So I'm looking forward to those discussions. But for my question for board members to have kind of more um, deliberation on is I went to a really interesting session on why do I lead? <laughs> and they ask um, administrators and board trustees all sitting together going, why? when you know kind of the late hours of board meetings and maybe the contentious or tension in the environment, why are you staying? Why are you there? What are you there for? And as they started talking, um, there was this, this need for people to say, we have to tell our stories. We have to say what's going on in education. It's really important to get that out. There was also this other part where people were saying, um, both administrators and trustees, it's also important to know your lane. I think that goes back to what you're talking about policies. You need to know as trustees what it is you can do versus what your administrators need to work on. And so they had some little action items or things that they had done. So one trustee mentioned um, that they actually have like a, um, a team and they have a trustee partner with an administrator, somebody on the cabinet. So they, when they um, get together sometimes they make do meetings or book clubs or whatever that is to keep meeting with somebody who's in cabinet. I thought, I don't really know if that works, but I'm curious from your point of view, trustees, what do you think um, helps with making sure we have that, I don't know, that, that extra check in place to know are we doing what we do as trustees and not going into other areas, not getting pulled in other directions, but focusing on what our job is and what we can do. And I don't know if y'all have answers. I'm just putting that out as a wondering. It's okay if you don't have an answer right now.
that's not fun to follow because you took all my thunder. <laughs> so it was good. It's okay. So uh, as enhance, an alternate enhance the, on it. <laughs> I was an alternate to the TASB delegation, delegation, and so yes, we're very excited about having all our legislative priorities passed and um, moved on. And I think one that we like to um, talk about is that cost of living adjustment for teachers and paying teachers appropriately. And so that has passed on through TASB, and that's just still a big conversation with our local legislators and teachers and, um, you know, looking at that adjustment for the Metroplex here in Austin. Um, so thanks for expanding on that. And then I did go to a community-based accountability, which is interesting because you know, I just, for a deeper understanding, because we're embarking on that process as a district and have created that committee and have people who are gonna be serving on that. But it was interesting on telling your story. And it's back to, if we're not telling our story, who's telling it for us? Or what um, misinformation or disinformation or somebody else doing a poor job of telling our story? And so um, I was really glad to attend that and just, um, want to encourage us to tell our story and, and have that partnership with that committee on how we do that work really well. I, I love those parts. And, and to hear you talk about community-based accountability, telling our story, that seems to resonate what we're all saying in a different session, too. I love that. It's a theme. Okay, were there any other thoughts as far as, I know I left a question and then we went on, but let me just go back. No, 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 I just wanna go back to it and ask, is there something you think as trustees we can do um, to help either enhance relationship with discussions um, that we're doing as trustees? Are there anything you would like to see in a team of eight training? I'm just going to wait a few minutes. It's okay if we have no answers. Okay. It was. All right. Let's keep looking. I really think there was a lot of good discussions taking place. Thank you all so much for sharing that. And um, we will move on to operations. I said I'd wait a minute. I waited like 30 seconds. That wasn't <laughs> fair. But I already saw the microphones move away, so I knew nothing was going to happen. So we're just moving on. Operations, consider approval of Raider Way right of way. And Jimmy Dissler is going to tell us what is in front of us this evening. There you go. Madam President, board members, Dr. Arterberry. Um, after many years of discussions, the city of Lander is now finalizing the design of the Raider, Raider Way and Eastwood View improvements. Um, as we can see on the map, the um, improvements go from Crystal Falls up Raider Way, and they will actually put a roundabout. You can see in that diagram, it's hard to see, but the blue area, and then they'll do all the improvements over to 183A, and then ultimately they'll have a right turn lane to help as you're heading north on the access road to make that turn onto Woodview. Um, the city has, um, if you look, you know, this is a city project and if you look on their website, the schedule that's posted right now will actually be under construction most likely within six months if everything goes well. They're anticipating to get bids in January and then if the bids come in as expected, they, you know, hopefully will be under construction in less than six months. And the duration of this project is about two years. It will be completed December of 2024. And, you know, this is their phasing plan. The, it's hard to tell the colors on this, but the new lanes of right away on the west side of right away will be built down to Crystal Falls and also the eastbound lanes of Woodview on the north and then phase two is going to be the roundabout the blue areas and then phase three will be the orange light orange areas basically replace the existing roadway at that point with new pavement and one of the things you know just to point out it's hard to see the pointer but down towards the bottom where Wiley Middle School is you can see where just off the road, there's actually a detention pond between the road and the parking lot in front of Wiley. And it's not shown on here, but if you go up to where 
Rouse is between the tennis courts and this road there will be a pond there and then on the other side of that drive there's a pond and so it's very tight for all the improvements as it sits right now and so the city is looking you know to complete the last bit of right away is what they're requesting from us it's in total 0.515 acres and so there's two stretches and then of course we will be if the board approves this right away in the right of um, conveyance of the special deed, then what will happen is Dr. Gearing will go and sign the docu or the easements that need to be in place for the drainage of the ponds, the sidewalk easements and temporary construction easements and public utility easements. So you can see all the improvements, but it's finally going to happen in <laughs> many years of discussions and you know the city did you know they had a roadblock recently that caused a redesign of the entire road because of drainage criteria new drainage criteria they adopted and so atlas 14 they call it it created the need to put those two ponds up by rouse and so that's they had to redesign it all and because now you're capturing a whole bunch of water up end and you got to convey that water and so that's but the city's done a good job and communication's been good and working with us and we anticipate a lot of meetings between once it starts with the campuses to, because it's going to impact traffic around those schools again so they are asking for action tonight if okay. possible Board any questions are there questions do you know if they had multiple designs to pick from no okay this is the only this design the only they have looked and considered many designs and this is the one the city has chose to move forward with i move that the board approve the resolution authorizing conveyance of right away and the special warranty deed dedication of right away of for waiter way as presented i second i have a motion from alexis second from christine are there any other discussions all right all those in favor please raise your hand five eyes no nays motion carries all right, thank you, Jimmy. All right, we will be moving on to closed session. For purposes permitted by Texas Government Code, well, let me do the time, it's 8.12. I know that's unusual for us, but at 8.12, the board's now gonna go into closed session. For purposes permitted by the Texas Government Code, 551.071, consultation with attorney regarding pending or contemplated litigation and our client privilege matter. Texas Government Code 551.074, deliberation regarding resignation, termination, employment, reassignments, duties, and evaluation of personnel and public officers. Texas Government Code 551.0821, deliberation regarding matters whereby personally identifiable information regarding one or more students will not will be disclosed. There will be no action in closed session. Any action related to closed session, agenda items will be taken when the board returns to open session.
All right, board members, it is 824 and we are back in open session. I will remember, you, remember remind you of two things. One, there's a board meeting debrief. Um, <laughs> just feel free to fill out the survey to tell us what you liked about the meeting, although I can guess there'll be some interesting things there. Um, anything you see for room improvement. And then when we leave, don't forget to hot dot to say how you thought the meeting went as far as feeling hopeful and did we do good board work. Um, so without further ado, are there any motions from closed session? I move that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendations for administrator probationary employment contract for personnel additions as presented. In accordance with the salary scale policies and contract of Leander Independent School District for the 2022-23 school year. I second. I have a motion from uh, uh, Sade, a second from Christine. Any other discussion? Uh, no discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Five ayes, no nays. I move that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendations for a teacher employment contract for personnel additions as presented in accordance with the salary scale, policies, and contract of Leander Independent School District for the 2022-23 school year. I second. All right. All those in favor? Uh, motion from Sade, second from Christine. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Five ayes, no nays. And that concludes all the motions from closed session. Board members, thank you so much for a great meeting. Um, and remember your board meeting debrief, we'll go to Cindy and that'll help us figure out if we need a, a break or any other meeting items you need taken care of. Without further ado, there are no items before us. It is 826 and we will adjourn.